Hello, everyone. Welcome to the Humans and Wildlife Show. I'm one of your co-hosts, George Terry. With me, as always, is my co-host, Christian Zasse. Christian, what are we going to talk about today? Hi, Georgia. Nice to see you again every week. <laughs> it's great. Well, we have a very interesting topic. We're going to learn how this bird behind us and other birds actually fly. How do they actually fly? I mean, nature's had millions of years to do that. And it was a a very much an inspiration of, of my friend, who is Dr. Sear, and he also works with the Hancock Wildlife Foundation. He's done so many things in his life, which is quite amazing. He's been all over the world. He studied engineering, studied medicine, been at the Children's Hospital in Vancouver, had written over 70 papers. Um, and because of his combined engineering and also his biology background, plus that he was actually at the Royal Air Force, which he'll probably tell us a little bit more. This is a, a perfect topic for Mike. So welcome, Mike. Welcome again to us. Thanks very much. Yeah, thanks for joining us, Mike. And so, Mike, you have some visuals for us. And I'm actually going to go ahead and take away. Well, yeah, why don't you share it big? Um, do you like it better with or without the chat overlay? I think I'll take away the chat and I'll just show people's you just, comments like this still right. so still say hi everybody yeah. okay hi to everyone so georgia you jump in anytime with questions so the question the uh, the topic today is how do birds fly now i can assure you that that little bird this is a bunting in a tree somewhere is not as insignificant as people often think I hope in this short talk to persuade you that if you understood everything about a bird, right down to its atomic level particles, you would understand the universe. They have been developing themselves to fly for 150 million years, and they really are uh, a miraculous little creatures. Now, we're just going to start. So a couple of quick questions. Um, from the chat is gentleman ghost has two questions and Mike feel free to let us know if these are things that you'll get to later perhaps but gentleman sure. ghost asks um, first can birds migrate over long distances without wind and second is there even a doldrums at the heights in which birds can migrate uh, there are very rarely doldrums at any height uh, above sea level wind what speed are doldrums really sorry <laughs> The doldrums are an old sailing term from uh, centuries ago uh, where there are parts of the globe where the competing winds uh, cancel each other out and you have areas of the ocean where there are no where there's no wind and it's fairly predictable and so they were called the doldrums so you get stuck in the doldrums then you got stuck in the doldrums in fact, there's a doldrum west of Vancouver. That's why if you if you want to sail from Vancouver to Hawaii, people go down to Los Angeles and then uh, head off into the ocean. If you head straight for Hawaii, you'll never get there because not very much wind. Oh, that's interesting because anyway, I heard that phrase, but I never knew where it came from. Okay. Um, yeah. So not the doldrums, not very many. Um, the second, the first part of the question then. Uh, well, yes, uh, of course, uh, um, birds can fly a long way. They, they do it in different ways. Some glide. Uh, eagles, for instance, fly up to Alaska without, they hardly flap their wings. They, they spiral up in, uh, in uh, thermals. They get up to 10,000 feet, stick their nose where they want to go, and off they go and glide. But yeah, other so birds, and we'll be looking, but we're looking at those other birds fly the whole way and we'll have a look at those uh, briefly in uh, in a little while yeah all right so the brief answers are first yes birds can migrate long distances without wind and two there are not usually doldrums involved in the migration sweet all right so continue on you were telling us about this um bunting i believe you said it's a little bunting yes so Anyway, as I say, what I want to uh, try and get you to appreciate, I'm sure many people watching can appreciate it anyway, but that this little creature is not just a bundle of fluff and it doesn't matter, he lives or dies. These are the most incredible animals. So just so people get an appreciation for the real beauty of flight, uh, Christian's got a couple of slow motion films that he made 
which may be a good idea to show here. So we know this is what we're talking about. Yeah, so Kristen, go ahead and share. Um, while he's sharing that, I'll answer this question. Do some birds like winter? Yes. So some birds, um, obviously you see some birds in winter and those are the ones, I don't know if they like it, but they're adapted to winter and you know do well during winter potentially and survive during it. Um, we talked actually a little bit about that last week, not for birds specifically, but just like animals dealing with winter and different seasons and stuff. Christian, how is the sharing going? Oh, Christian, I can't hear you now. Have you muted yourself? Yes, sorry. Here I am. Here I am. Um, one second. You should be able, hopefully you can see my screen now. I uh, for don't. Sharing. You don't think so? Okay. Let I me think we only have Mike's screen. Did you click share, I screen, at share screen? Oh, I cannot believe that here we go again. <laughs> Sorry. <laughs> what are you hearing or seeing? Okay, wait. Uh, Mike, go on. I'll tell you what. I'm going to give a link to Georgia where, okay. where my clip is on YouTube. So please carry on. Also. Okay. Okay. Yeah, Mike, sh share that picture again. And Mike, you don't need to like pull it out of the window, you can just keep it. Yeah, you can just keep it there. Um, right here. Yeah. So, so we're gonna, well, we're gonna watch some birds flying in slow motion. And that's gonna show us like how intricate their flight is. Am I guessing correctly? Yes, a bird flies past your nose. You don't really get an, 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 an impression of just what's going on. Uh, but a slow motion film, and particularly with a hummingbird, where its uh, wings are moving at 80 beats per second, uh, you're not going to get uh, an idea of what's going on without a slow motion film. But anyway, we'll, we'll, let, uh, we'll let Christian dig out some of his films and I'll just press on. So three sets of animals have uh, worked out how to fly. Uh, we have to go back a long way. We get to the insects. Once the blue-green algae started to get going, uh, eating CO2 and excreting oxygen, then obviously the atmospheric oxygen level got to a point where animals have got enough energy uh, to get moving. And the first ones to use that were the insects. And they got off the ground about 350 million years ago. We won't be talking much about insects today because they operate at a range of what is called a low Reynolds number. What that means is that that size and weight, they're at a different type of physics. And to an insect, the air is not just uh, a compressible substance. It's more like a viscid liquid to an, uh, to an insect. The birds, um, the ones we're talking about today, it's generally accepted that birds uh, were a branch of a small theropod, which is a type of dinosaur. In fact, the theropods are the uh, T-Rex dinosaurs. And, but birds uh, are branched off a small T-Rex. Um, the, uh, they did that about 150, 160 million years ago. And there are two interesting things here. You've got to, first of all, how did birds develop feathers and the general shape they had? But how did they also develop flight? We haven't really got time. It may well have been that they were, uh, they could crawl up a tree and glide to another tree. And just with time, they sorted out how to flap their wings. But there's a great deal of argument about how flight itself developed. Now, as everyone knows, uh, uh, dinosaurs so, disappeared from. Sorry. Oh no, you're you're. Go, um, I was just going to point out to people in case you didn't pick up on it. So everything we're seeing on the screen right now, I'm picking up. It has the same y-axis. So like time is moving along, and I wish I could do a little pointer, but basically, like you have this blue bump in the middle, right? And that's where the oxygen levels get really high. And that's mm. where if we look above it, suddenly we see insects branching off. Actually, a little bit before that, that's when like insects and flying insects became a thing. So basically, the takeaway, right, is that there's like oxygen and you need oxygen to fuel your muscles for flight. And so once there is enough oxygen in the atmosphere, all these animals started flying, right? Well, obviously, the blue, the blue green algae uh, had to sit around in the oceans for a long, long time before they produced enough oxygen to uh, get the atmospheric oxygen somewhere around 20%. But if it's sitting around 5%, everyone's hypoxic. No one's going to be doing anything. They're just going to sit there. So the birds, as we say, developed during 
dinosaur times. They were an offshoot of dinosaurs. Uh, and again, as everyone knows, dinosaurs disappeared from the fossil re uh, record at about 60 million years ago. And that gave the mammals a bit of room and they obviously took off at that point. And the bats uh, developed a flight um, at about 50 million years ago. So, and so we'll, maybe boat, this is a good time. Is this a good time to watch the videos, Mike? Anytime. Uh, yeah. Jump in, please. Yeah. So I have the videos up. And so, yeah, you've talked about flight. It's incredibly energy expenditure. Expen you expend a lot of energy when you're flying. And so, what exactly is happening? And you can leave your screen, Mike. I'll just take it away for a moment. And right. or I'll just hide it for a moment and share my own. And so, Christian, are these your videos that we're going to be watching? They're all mine, yes. All of them, yes. Okay. Um, so here is the first one, and I'll turn up the volume. And so, Christian, if you want to feel free to narrate I'll, I'll, or mic I'll, too, of I'll course. Ex I will explain this, of course. Yeah, well, this is just music, of course. <laughs> but um, and, anyway, this, this was taken in Dutch Harbor in Alaska. Um, and it's it's quite incredible with a with a high speed camera, twelve frames per second. And what's beautiful is that you that you see the very fine and the the, the incredible flexibility of of the primary and secondary feathers, and how complex flight actually is. I mean, to study this movie alone, and just look at also the air passing on the upper side of the wing, how little resistance there is, and how well the whole body uh, sort of floats in in air i mean mike you 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 can happily comment on this too but there's so much to say i guess mm. well i will just say there's a very good example of uh bernoulli's theorem that the air across the top of the wing has to go faster and uh, bernoulli, bernoulli point out the air goes faster the pressure drops and as the pressure above the wing drops you can see it pulling up the feathers that's why the feathers are being lifted and they're not being blown up, they're being sucked up because of the low pressure on top of right. the wing. Yeah, and I'm curious, um, could people hear okay in the chat? Let us know if the volume is too loud on the Or oh, the music, videos. just turn the music down maybe because... Okay. Um, yeah, just turn Here it off. Here it is. Turn it off, okay. So here's the next video. And this is just remarkable how an eagle lands. It's just so beautiful and it's very complex. Look what it does with its tail feathers all. And uh, and there's no stalling, right? There's no stall here. It just comes. We'll, <laughs> we'll come to stalling later, but uh, you see the, the, well, we'll talk about this later, but you can see the, the wing of, an, of a bird is variable geometry. It, they can change their, the shape of their wing uh, depending on what they're doing, flying, taking off, gliding. And you see he's coming into land, so he needs big wings to produce a little lift. So he has his uh, tip feathers splayed out. They have muscles at the root of the feather, so they have some control over the movement of the feather. And um, and also his primary feathers here are splayed out to double the size of his wing, essentially, and double his lift. They are extraordinary creatures. This is crazy. Is This, is, this looks like CGI or something. <laughs> I know, it's a beautiful film. Yeah. Yeah, so when you say variable geometry, you mean like they're changing the shape, the angle, because they're kind of like extending and retracting the wing, correct? Yes, you might have uh, you might have seen a couple of airplanes where humans in their primitive way will do the same thing. That is, a, when a plane is landing, it wants its wings straight out with lots of uh, lift to land. But if it's a fighter jet, it wants the wings swept back when it's going at high speed. And a few jets have put in, have done that. Uh, mm. The F-14 and uh, does it and uh, a couple of others. But it's a hell of a lot of engineering just to get your wings to move. But they're either out or in, not the infinite complexity of an eagle. Yeah. This video is, oh, here we go. Here's the hummingbird, that's incredible. That's 2000 frames per second. Um, I mean, what, what, is, what is remarkable, this was very difficult to film because you can see this all happens in less than a, a second, a split second, actually, how a hummingbird can evade a wasp. It's it's like a dance in the air. And it's completely different to an eagle, of course. The wing movements are more similar to an insect than, than uh, you know, than to an eagle. So 
It's just yeah, remarkable. this video is nuts. You can see the insects' wings flapping too. The the wasps' wings. Yes, and it and, and look how uh, did you see how quick that was? You can't even see yeah. it. Um, so it's 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 incredible. The it, it is very interesting. I mean, we can be at this thing all day. Yeah, but course. a hummingbird, if you remember the eagle, basically his, his wings are flapping down. He's got a power stroke, and then he lifts his wings back uh, to neutral position. And he's down for his power stroke. A hummingbird doesn't do that. A hummingbird hasn't got the luxury of a negative time to get his wings back up into the, the power position. And so a hummingbird is able to gen generate lift on both the upstroke and the downstroke. So he doesn't have an upstroke, he has a figure of eight stroke. So he has a downward stroke um, uh, for, 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 for lift on his downward stroke. And then he has a sort of paddling backstroke where he produces lift then on the top of his wing on the way back. So he, he never has a period when, he hasn't, when he's not producing lift. It's, it's yes. extraordinary. So there you see it perfectly. Yeah, if you look at the top eight. edge of the wing, you can see the figure yeah. eight. Yeah. So he's making lift on both the downstroke and the backstroke. It's extraordinary. So cool. There's another hummingbird video, I believe. Yeah, there's one more when it drinks. Um, also uh, really beautiful. Did you see that, how it changed? Uh, how they change... Um, Oh, that's that's just the drink part, of course, with a bifurcated tongue, which is also. Mm. Um. Oh, so cool! So we can look at. Let's look at one of the the eagle video again, real quick, just to compare. Now that we've looked at that one type of flight, we can yeah. see the difference. Oh, this in is there. incredible. Like Mike yeah. says, I mean, the so on his backstroke, he yeah. doesn't want to. He's not going to get lift. But at least he doesn't want drag. So on his backstroke, he folds his wings in so they produce less resistance to the air. But he also opens his feathers up so that the air can go between the feathers and reduce the drag, the drag on his that's upstroke. It. That's it, yes. It takes 150 million years to learn really how to do that. Really smart, isn't it? Really smart, yes. Yeah. Yeah, I'm not sure so... smart is quite the term. I don't think it's... Well, I mean, for us, it's... it's uh... <laughs> <laughs> it just takes smart. a long it's time. Of evolution of mother evolution. As you can see, so I think the nice thing about showing the eagles and showing how movies is when you say, oh, how do birds fly? You're not just, it's not a one size fits all. They are just unimaginably complex. So when you are saying, well, these are the general ways that birds fly, hummingbirds don't adapt those, uh, those various variables in the same way as a, as a, as a stork or an eagle. So cool. All right, I will stop sharing now. Um, and we have, yeah, I'm sure we have some comments from the audience here. Gentleman Ghost says, um, kind of interesting how different flight methods developed in different species. Yeah, hummingbird, eagle, dragonflies, etc. cetera. Um, but yeah, it's interesting to see the similarities and differences and, and the degree to which it's, you know, evolutionary conserved versus not you know like flight i'm assuming flight developed once in birds and then it like diverged into different types of bird flight like hummingbird versus eagle um, yes. versus you know as you showed in your previous slide mike um you know flight developed independently in birds versus insects versus mammals and i believe flight developed independently several times in insects actually if i'm remembering that correctly I'm sure but They've yeah been around for 350 million years ago until they got up to all sorts of mischief in that time yeah they had all kind they had all kinds of mischievous time um yeah those videos were super super cool thanks for sharing um so i go ahead and show your screen again um, okay yeah so the earliest uh, birds uh, about 160 million years ago was an archaeopteryx so it's greek for early wing and um, it came out, it was found in a German um, quarry in 1861. In fact, all of the archaeopteryxes have been found in German quarries. And so they tend also to have a German name, so it's Urvogel, an <laughs> early bird. So they found this rather conveniently two years after the Origin of Species was published, about 160 million years ago. 
and is often claimed amongst those who do not believe in evolution that there has never been a fossil that shows the development an interspecies uh, animal somewhere between this one and that one. That's not true at all. And the Archaeopteryx is a perfect example of this. It shows features of birds and reptiles. So it has modified forelimbs, of course, uh, and feathers. And it also has its first toe has gone round posteriorly, like a bird. But it also has a long bony tail, which birds do not have, reptiles do. It doesn't have a beak, it has jaws, and it has teeth. And at the front of its modified forelimbs, there are still reptilian claws. So it shows clear uh, features of birds and reptiles. And this is an artistic, an artist's impression of what this little beast would have yep. been like. Mike, just a quick question to that, because of course 160 million years ago, also the composition of air was different and the environmental conditions were different. Can you maybe comment on that? How that would have been maybe different from a respiration or from even from a flight point of view? Well, I mean, you can only say that if this thing can, can get itself off the ground, mm -hmm. its cardiorespiratory uh, uh, level was pretty good because it's quite difficult to fly. And uh, only one set of mammals has managed it. The bird has, again, we haven't got time to go into the lungs of a bird, but a, a bird's lungs are completely different from a mammal's lungs. Oddly enough, their heart, their cardiac system uh, evolved over time to be exactly the same as ours. It's a four chamber heart with uh, intact ventricular septum serving two separate circulations, a pulmonary and a systemic. It's exactly the same as ours, but their lungs are completely different. Mm -hmm. and, I always uh, thought so that, Mike, do we know that, that Archaeopteryx could do powered flight for sure? Or do they think like maybe it just kind of like glided like down from treetops that it climbed up or something? Yes, I know it's, it looks as if it could fly, but that's not very good proof. I think it's generally accepted that it was a, it was the first true flying, uh, well, the sort of bird of a type. Uh, but yes, the whole argument of how flight started and who did it first will bring scientists to blows. <laughs> so <laughs> I think I'll just stick myself in a black box and say... <laughs> well, um, I mean, the insects, was, it was again, the first the one. insects really do just have, uh, have the birds and the mammals beat undoubtedly. But Yes, but don't, yeah. but don't forget, the, the insects are not using the same physics. Yeah. Reynolds' number sums up uh, the viscosity of the air that we flow through, the size, the weight. It's a. Um, You're saying a insects unit. are disqualified. You're like, it's too. Not really, no, no, not really disqualified. But if you're making conclusions about bird flight, you can't draw, uh, uh, you can't uh, extrapolate back to yeah. insects. They're, they're working in different physics. To them. Very well said. Uh, yeah. Uh, to them, the, the, the air is a viscid liquid. Mm -hmm. So it doesn't matter what you are, insect or, a, or a, 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 a bird, you have to deal with the four forces of flight or a transport airplane for that matter. You have to have thrust to get yourself moving. You have to overcome drag, which is trying to stop you. You need a source of lift. And of course, you need to battle ever-present gravity. And those four apply to everything that gets its, gets itself off the ground. We, of course, uh, do not stand a chance of raising enough lift to get our, ourselves off the ground. Uh, but birds do it with ease. So we go through those forces quickly, one at a time, in no particular order. The first thing you've got to do is minimize drag. Now, there are different types of drag, but the obstruction to airflow that any moving object faces is called form drag. And it is obviously minimized by streamlining and there's endless examples of race cars and so on and so on. Birds have sorted out that you, they do best at their particular speed uh, by developing a teardrop. On the left here is a uh, Cooper's hawk screaming along. And on the right is, of course, a king penguin, uh, which... Uh, it no longer flies, but it sort of flies underwater and it's developed the same a general shape. It's sort of legs are tucked in. 
It's got uh, vestigial wings, which it uses as flippers under the water. And so it has a lot of drag to, over, to, to overcome because, of course, the, the water is a lot thicker. And then another form of drag is surface friction. And feathers are extraordinarily good at reducing surface friction. As we've already talked about, when the bird makes the upstroke, the feathers open up as they do on this owl, and the owl has also brought his wings in uh, to reduce the drag on that necessary upstroke. And what is more, owls are able to minimize uh, turbulence around their wings. Nobody really understands it. It's probably got something to do with these leading edge uh, little featherlets. Um, and I've done quite a lot of uh, raptor rehabilitation work. And if you have an eagle and you let it go, you throw it up. It sounds like someone trying to dry their washing in the wing. It is not a silent flyer. Hmm. But an owl, if you throw an owl up into the air and it beats its wings, you will not hear a single thing. It is quite extraordinary. So and then I should... Mike, Sorry. does that mean, does that noisiness correspond to like how much they're reducing surface friction? So you're saying that like for owls, because yeah. they have to be quiet for their hunting, they yes. have a specially low surface friction as well? Yes. I mean, the noise is uh, a vortex, a vortices of air and turbulent air, and that turbulence is produced by the drag as the air fl uh, flies over a very rough surface, or in this case, a smooth surface. So if you make no, no, no noise, you are, um, you're, you've got drag sorted out. And I should add that the latest iteration of wind turbines use owl technology to reduce the noise. So the next one uh, you've got to deal with is gravity. Well, gravity isn't going away, but birds, have spent a lot of time um, maximizing or minimizing their weight. Their bones are hollow, not all of them, obviously. They have they need to make bone marrow to make blood cells, same as we do. But the most of their bones are hollow. Um, they don't have jaws or teeth, they only have thin beaks. And they really their skeleton is an extraordinary structure. And of course, the biggest bone is down here, the keel-shaped sternum. Those are where the flight muscles insert. And they are this shape for the very good reason that all of the, the innards of the bird hang from the wing in the most stable manner. If it were the other way around and the wings were below the body, it would be unstable. Just a quick question, Mike, because it's very interesting, of course, uh, if the bird, or well, we know that the bird bones are hollow, um, apart from the structural difference between humans and birds, does it also differ from the composition of calcium or so, or is it really only structural? I don't know the difference in, uh, in the actual makeup of the bones, uh, but the wall is a lot thinner mm -hmm. and the center is uh, hollow, except, as I said, in those bones where they have to have bone marrow to make their own red cells, same as us. But it's quite interesting that it isn't time to go into the lungs of a bird, but a bird's lungs are in two forms. There's the gas exchange segment, which isn't expensable at all. And then there are about nine air sacs within the body. And the air sacs expand and contract and move air through the gas exchange part of the lung, which is the little sponge with tubes in it. And those air sacs extend down the hollow bones. So if you happen to want to do this, if you broke a chicken's humerus in half and blew down it, you will expand the air sacs and put air through the lungs. So, the, the and to continue purpose, the... Sorry, the purpose of which being? I mean, I'm just trying to understand... I don't know. Of, you don't know? I don't know. It's just those, okay. those air sacs in the body... Really? ...extend out down the humerus. That's incredible. No clue why. Yes, I know. So if, you, so if he breaks a bone, then they can get a pneumothorax. So, um, birds are very strange creatures once you start looking at them. The wings, of course, are minimized. The bones and the feather shafts are hollow. 
And this is a frigate bird. If you've ever been to Galapagos, you'll have seen a frigate bird. Uh, you sometimes see them in Hawaii flying in over the sea. Um, it has a seven foot wingspan, as big as an eagle, but its skeleton only weighs four or five ounces. The entire skeleton holding this bird together weighs the same as a hummingbird, basically. That takes a while. And they have endless other adaptations within their body to reduce their weight. For instance, they only have one ovary. They have a left ovary. The right ovary is vestigial. And they don't have outlets for the urinary tract, the digestive tract, and reproductive systems. All three systems empty into a common cloaca. The young gestate and grow outside the body, of course. They have an egg and then they put it in a nest so the, the female doesn't have to fly around uh, carting a, a fetus. The respiratory system is smaller and more efficient than the mammalian equivalent. And the reproductive system, the, particularly the fallopian tube that the egg goes through, actually regresses outside the mating season. And also, birds can control their body weight closely. So if they're not migrating, they, they control their eating to keep a body weight stable. Because fat birds don't fly very well. So the third one is thrust. Now, in an airplane, lift is produced by the wing and thrust is produced by an engine. Uh, airplanes don't flap their wings for that reason, but birds, of course, generate thrust and lift from the same structure, the wings. And so it's very different in them. So here on the left is a bird in the process of taking off. And the bird adjusts the type of flapping and the shape of his wings, for that matter, in order to make the lift and the thrust, the sum of them, pick him off the ground. And then when this bird is flying forwards, he'll adjust the flight pattern of his wings so that lift is more vertical and his thrust is more straight ahead, opposing drag. And then when he's coming into land, as we saw that eagle, he'll bring his body up and he'll be flapping back to slow his, um, slow his body weight and again changing the shape of his wings uh, to increase the surface area so he'll make more lift just as he's coming down uh, to land. It's worth remembering that birds don't just use their muscles. It's very hard work staying up. So if they don't have to do it, they won't. The peregrine has a, a name for being the fastest flyer. It, I'm not sure I believe some of the claims you hear over 300 kilometers an hour. It certainly goes well over 100 kilometers an hour, but it doesn't fly at that speed. It flies at a stoop. And when it sees a pigeon it wants to eat, it will point itself downhill, tucks in its wings and its feet, and obviously the power source there is gravity. A hovering osprey, of course, is using his flight muscles, as is the uh, hummingbird. But even then, he will, the, the bird will face into wind. So if there's a 20, 30 knot wind, then he's in this sort of free lift by the wind going over his wings. The albatross can go out to sea for well over a year, never touches land. And um, the albatross can manipulate the vortices down by, uh, produced by wind going over waves. So here he is down the bottom in the lee of the wave. He flies up the front of the wave. And the moment he hits the wind, he gets a kick under his wings and throws him into the air. And he can keep that up all day. And here's a condor here, uh, just riding thermal, thermal updrafts. And another one, he can just fly like that all day, looking for something to eat. Now here are the bird flight muscles, as we saw this skeleton before. Here are the modified uh, forelimbs, wings. And anyone who's eaten a turkey will know what we're dealing with here. So you chop the wings off, chop the head off, uh, fold the legs in. And of course, it is the keel that you're looking at when the turkey's on his back coming out of the oven. So inserted into the keel is a top muscle on the left here. It's called the deltoid that inserts into the humerus. So when this muscle contracts, it pulls the wing down forcefully, generating lift and thrust. Underneath the deltoid is called another muscle called the supracoracoideus, which passes through a small tunnel in the complex shoulder of the bird and inserts on the other side of the humerus. So when that, when that muscle constricts, it lifts the wing up. There are other muscles involved, but these are the two principal muscles um, uh, involved in flight. 
So next time you're carving a turkey, that's what you are carving through, is the, is the flight muscles of a bird. So the final one is lift. Now, lift is produced by an aerofoil. No one will argue about that. And people have been utilizing the properties of an aerofoil for a very long time. At the top left here is the oldest aerofoil, boomerang, uh, that's ever been discovered. And it is 23,000 years old. And it's made from uh, ivory tusk. And while it is a boomerang, you'll be surprised here it's not from Australia. This one was found in Poland. This is the oldest one in Australia, and that is um, 10,000 years old. And you'll never guess where these ones, these are throwing sticks. Some of them are throwing sticks that don't have an aerofoil. They, you throw them, you miss, you have to walk and go and pick them up. But this bottom one is an aerofoil. And these come from Tutankhamun's tomb. So humans have discovered aerofoils and utilized their properties for a very long time. And of course, an aerofoil is, a, is a, an essential part of modern life. Here it is the aerofoil of a, a wing, uh, the aerofoil of a, of a uh, wind turbine, gas turbines, the propellers on a boat. There's endless applications of aerofoils. Now, the odd thing is that over the years, scientists have developed accurate mathematical models, both to design a wing and predict exactly what it's going to do. That's fine. But there isn't general agreement about how the thing actually works. How does it generate that lift? And there is still argument to this day about how an aerofoil generates lift. It's, it's the same as transistor radios. The earliest radios and transistor radios before transistor radios were developed and worked fine, but no one understood the uh, even the structure of the atom. So you can go a long way just on a bit of math. Nature, as usual, got there first. This is 350 million years ago as a, uh, a little um, Paleodictyoptera. There's the Archaeopteryx at 150 million. And of course, many seeds have some form of an aerofoil to help them twirl and get further away from the thing the tree. And um, here's a, uh, a flying fish. They can fly a surprisingly long way uh, when they're frightened. And of course, a mammal, uh, the, uh, the bat. So this story is not apocryphal. It's absolutely true. Einstein uh, got in on the act and designed his own wing. In 1916, he proposed a new wing design in Die Naturwissenschaften based on Bernoulli's theory. At the time, it was believed, and still is, that wings, aerofoils produce lift by speeding up air over the upper surface. That reduces pressure and lift. The, the airplane is basically sucked into the air. So Einstein argued that if you want a little bit of curvature, then a lot more curvature must be good. And this is a picture of the actual model of Einstein's wing. Now, because Einstein's miracle year had been in 1905, he was now, by 1916, a world star. And if Einstein said this is the way a wing should look, then that's the way a wing should look. It was called a Katzburkel, uh, a cat's back wing, because of the shape of it. It was tested in a wing tunnel and found to be absolutely hopeless. <laughs> but Einstein's reputation meant that it was built and used on a military plane. The test pilot's report still exists. And this <laughs> unfortunate man, Earhart, said it after a long, long time on the ground, it staggered into the air and flew like a pregnant duck. And he refused to risk his life testing it again, said the happiest moment of his life was when he got back on the ground alive. <laughs> so in later life, Einstein referred to it as his youthful folly. So Einstein couldn't work it out. So. There should be a lesson there somewhere. So how does a wing produce lift? Well, Bernoulli's theorem is often quoted, but it is not the full story by any means. If you speed up uh, the air over the upper surface, curved upper surface, then it reduces pressure. And it's argued that sucks the, the, uh, the bird or plane into the air. A far uh, a theory that gains far more traction now is based on Newton, not Bernoulli. 
And it simply says that the wing is a pump. The, the air hits the bottom surface of the wing, it is deflected downwards, and so there's an equal and opposite force upwards. You do need an aerofoil because in order to maintain the pumping air downwards, the air has to smoothly flow over the wing or the whole thing falls to pieces. Now, as Mark, hang on, hang on, hang on. That uh, with uh, let's go to Bernoulli's theory. What's one one moment? Um, so I think I don't think there's anything wrong with the interpretation of Bernoulli's theory because what what they're basically saying is the air on top because it goes faster. You, the, the equation goes static plus uh, uh, plus dynamic pressure is is constant. So the argument of Bernoulli's theory is that if it goes on the top of the wing, the way is longer, and they meet at the end. I think the pro probably the misconception goes that they don't that the air molecules do not hit at the same time. The path over the top is definitely longer, and it does thereby produce uh, pr produce less pressure, which will cause an uplift. Right. Well, let me tell you that. The strong men come to blows over this, but there's several problems wrong with Bernoulli's aeroplane. Okay. If a wing, the curved aerofoil, is a structure that produces lift going upwards because of the air flowing over the longer path, it is a lift generating object producing lift upwards. How do aeroplanes fly upside down? Wait, do airplanes fly upside down? Did I hear that correctly? Yeah, how does an airplane fly upside down? If its wings are machines that generate lift that go upwards. So if you turn this lift generating machine upside down, the air is still going on a longer path over the uh, upper wing surface. How does the airplane stay up? It should accelerate towards the ground. Mm -hmm. I'm so confused. Is this a thing that people have done? They've flown air. Oh, I do they do, right? Like if you flip it. Yeah. Sorry, yeah, I'm time. like, take it's taking me a moment. We can um, get rather lost. I mean, and also, it, uh, sorry, go ahead. Yeah, I mean, to some degree, it's not like they stay upside down for long. And so they do have a lot of like forward momentum potentially that's like helping them stay no, an aerobatic, aerobatic airplane can fly upside down all day if it wants. Really? Wow, I'm like, yeah. these basic things about planes I did not know. Yes, I, I know. Guess. Well, yeah, I, I don't think it's necessary to get lost in the details. I'm sure it's been on for hours. This is not easy, okay? So. I know, it's gone on for a lot longer than hours. Uh, yeah, it's gone on for everyone knows about say, some years. for me, apparently. Annabelle's like, planes fly upside down all the time. I don't know, everyone's seen them. I fly also, on planes, we stay right side up. I need to watch more stunt plane videos. Yes. So the other thing there, Christian, just quickly, because we don't have to drag this on. Yeah, uh, I understand. The, in a mammal, the wing is only, you know, a millimeter thick. And so it is cambered. But the, the, the distance along the, the top of the wing is the same as it is on the bottom of the wing. So there isn't a longer distance for the right. air to flow on the upper surface. So are you saying we don't really understand why we fly, why, why, you know, what, what the mechanism behind it is? Would you go so far or is it just different? Uh, it or is an example where just because you understand and can predict the outcome, does not mean that you understand how it is generating lift. Oh, okay. Yes, Comment, it is yeah. exactly Comment the same. It's exactly the same as the science. early days of quantum mechanics. Yeah, the early days, the quantum mechanics theorems, uh, equations that came out, did not seem to be based on any sort of normal physics. And the saying at the time was, "Shut up and calculate," because the calculations worked. But just because your calculations work, doesn't mean you understand how it works. Okay, got it. Yes. Okay. Yeah, it's a common thing. That if you put your hand outside, interests. if you if you put your hand outside uh, an air uh, the, the window, car window, when you're going 100 kilometers an hour, there's a strong force on your hand. Yeah. And it will push your hand up. Yeah. And so Newton is probably uh, 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 closer to the the argument. It, you have to have a smooth airflow, and that will produce a, a reduced pressure on the top. But it is a wing is basically a pump. 
it's pumping air downwards uh, in order to produce enough force uh, to balance the weight of the plane. Right, like you're saying, it's not just one or the other, and to some degree, it depends on no, the it is not like whether yes. you're flapping or gliding. Yeah, like the yes. like the bats, like you mentioned, they have a thin millimeter yes. thick wing that doesn't have that is, curvature to it, and they're flapping. Or if they're gliding, is, they're gliding slowly down. <laughs> yeah. It is the camber of the wing, probably. Mm. But I, I, I have to say that we should not get lost in the weeds of the <laughs> mathematics. Okay. <laughs> Which are, I would agree. So anyway, you have to have smooth flow. Or neither Bernoulli nor Newton will come to your aid. And so if the, if the, the wing, the angle of attack is too high, and the airplane is going too slowly, uh, obviously coming into land is when planes tend to fall out of the air, um, then you have what's called a stall, where the air breaks away from the upper surface of the wing, you no longer have any substantial lift, and down you go. So airplanes, if you've ever sat on a passenger airplane looked out of the window, as you're coming into land, the wing almost seems to break up into pieces as the flaps come down, uh, the slats open up, and actually on the front of the wing, there are leading edge slats as well. And all of this is designed to make the wing more cambered and allow the air to pass through it without breaking away. Mm. Now, birds can do that without being told. This owl coming in to land, again, you can see the feathers of the owl being lifted up because the pressure on the top of the wing is much lower and these uh, is sucking his wings into the air. And you can see on this spoonbill, he needs a lot of lift. He's going slowly, so he still needs a lot of lift, so he needs bigger wings. So he's expanded out his feathers, he's spread out his wingtips, he's got his, he's got his tail feathers opened out, he's flapping away, and controlling his descent so he doesn't have a tremendous crash uh, when well, he's landing in water. I suppose he's not going to do too badly. And this eagle, is, and if you look at the at the leading edge of the owl's wing, this little bit that sticks out here is called the allula, little wing, and that is a bird's equivalent. Skeletally, it's the bird's thumb, but uh, aerodynamically, it's a leading edge slat. And as you see birds coming into land, you'll see the in the leading edge, you can see it in the stalk here, but you can see it in this bat. It's a very obvious allula. Bald eagles have, a, have quite a sub, substantial allula. If you look at your, your pictures of bald eagles flying, you'll see a leading edge slat uh, coming out as they come into land. So oh, we still have a lot to learn. That's an interesting comment we, from Aaron. I'm just, you want to read it out, um, Georgia? That's an interesting You can read it. Yeah. Yeah, the camber keeps the, keeps the flow smooth and attached while the angle of attack deflects the airflow downward relative to the wing. The low pressure vacuum above the wing theory is not the answer. It used to be a belief there was. That's what I thought, you know, that's what I was referring to. So you, yeah, I see. No, it's more, um, the, the, the mechanics, the fluid mechanics are summed up by a bunch of equations. Uh, called the Navier Stokes. I don't think we need to go, except it's a modification of an earlier German mathematician called Euler. I really don't think we're going to get anything in by getting lost in those mathematics, except to say that the mathematics can predict very accurately what the wing will do. But it doesn't mean that you understand why the wing is doing it. Right. It's not quite magic. It just means we don't have the full story. Mm -hmm. So, anyway, so to say we have a lot to learn is uh, an <laughs> understatement. Okay. So this hummingbird here hovering at 80 beats a second uh, while he's sucking out this nectar is a miracle on its own. I agree. It's hardly got, hardly got any uh, legs. Uh, the albatross here, they're out at sea for a year more much more than a year actually they never come to land that's they incredible sleep on, they sleep on the wing and uh here they're using they're staying aloft using the vortices induced by the wind hitting the front of this wave this one over here you can see some of them are just in the in the 
in the light wind, in the shadow of the uh, wave, and then they fly up the front of that wave. They, they must hardly ex wave. expend any energy. I mean, how else are you going to explain yes. this, right? I mean, it's crazy. I know, it's incredible. And then you've got a puffin, obviously in the south, in the southern hemisphere, uh, uh, you have um, penguins. Uh, they don't appear in the northern hemisphere, but in the norm northern hemisphere, the, the, uh, the, 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 the puffins evolved in a, a very similar way, except a puffin hasn't lost its ability to fly. So you're dealing here with a bird which can fly and dive underwater and paddle underwater and catch fish underwater which is just too complex even to, there aren't adjectives. And this last one here is my favorite. This, this bird is called a bar-tailed godwit. And of course it's got a satellite tracker on it. And this bird is actually famous. He's got a name, well, he's got a number. This is 4BBRW. Godwits travel from Alaska to New Zealand, then they fly up the coast back to China, across the Aleutians and back to Alaska. And this guy holds is the current world record. If you look up his number for BBRW, in some parts he's quite a celebrity. He holds the record of flying 12,200 kilogram kilometers from Alaska, New, uh, New Zealand. 12,200 kilometers in 224 hours. He didn't what? stop flapping. Yes, he didn't stop flapping. He's, it's not a glide, it's a flap. He flapped every inch of the way and uh, he slept on the wing, he ate on the wing, and uh, then he got to New Zealand. When he got to New Zealand, he had a bit of a breather, something to eat, then flies back up to China, across the Aleutians and back to Alaska. So explain that, if you will, not just that's, how he does it physiologically. That's nine days, I just, it's nine days. Yes. 12,200 kilometers. So that's nuts. try that. <laughs> it is well, nuts. We have some questions here um, that only add to our sense of mystery on this topic. So David Howden- There is only a sense of mystery. There are no answers here. <laughs> David Howden, who didn't want to interrupt earlier, he said, um, some of the larger insects are bigger than the smallest birds, I think. Do those birds treat air like a viscous fluid? Um, no, it's a matter of a number, a, a unitless number called Reynolds number. And uh, it's a matter of your weight and your surface area and a bunch of other get things get thrown into it. So if your Reynolds number is down uh, about five or tw five to 20 range, then you are in, then you are experiencing viscosity. Yeah, I, wa I wonder if part of it is if you're bigger than that, weight is involved. And like a big lunar yes, moth might have more surface area than a oh, hummingbird, yes, but a it big. doesn't weigh more, yeah. I mean, a big lunar moth is you know, about the size of a hummingbird. So yeah. yes, no, it's a continuum. Don't, uh, but you can't study uh, the flight of a uh, noceum or even a mosquito and draw you know uh, straight lines with how a bald eagle flies. Makes so sense. there we are. Incredible. So to end then. All I would like to do is get you thinking about really the miraculous uh, qualities of birds. And next time somebody tells you that crows are just rats with wings, <laughs> ignore them because the crows are cleverer than he is. Look at the intelligence in that crow's, in that crow's eye. Also, rats are answer. very smart, I would have to point out. But yes, yes. rats are smart too. <laughs> Good. And I Probably hope not as smart as interest. Well, I don't know, actually, but yeah. I don't know. It'd be an interesting point. Yeah. Right. Yeah. Any, so, well, yeah, audience members, it is your last chance for comments, questions, your bird flight mysteries to be explored. Um, thank you so much, Mike, for an interesting topic. It was really Great. cool. Great. Yeah, welcome. Yeah. Now we know less than before, for sure. Yeah, definitely one of those kinds of situations. <laughs> That's the result. I, I think, think I actually do know more than before, though. Oh, I hope so. Yeah. <laughs> no, I mean by that, there are more questions than. <laughs> yeah. No. Def yeah, definitely. It's uh, yeah. the more you know, the more you're aware of how much you don't know. Type of situations. Yeah. 
Uh, very interesting, Mike. Thank you. Really interesting. Yeah. Stunning. Well, if there are no other questions coming up in the chat, um, I'd like to say thank you to everyone for joining us as usual, and especially thanks to Mike for joining us a second time for an interview and sharing your knowledge with us. Um, Christian, yeah, closing thoughts? Well, just stunning, you know. I mean, um, I, I obviously have to do some reading again because I, don't, I thought I understood some things which I now found out I don't. So I better get back to the drawing board. <laughs> so it's all, all good. Thank you, Mike. Really good. Okie doke. Yeah, there is a question here from Gentleman Ghost. How much has human aeronautics used this information from nature? They're actively studying it still. I think especially in like drone world where they're developed, there's a lot of room for development in flight. There are, um, I know bat people that got funding from the military, for example, to study bat flight um, and how that, you know, when the military wants to, one's interested in that information because it might improve continue to improve our human aeronautical abilities. Yeah, so under investigation. Mike, anything to add to that? No, but uh, birds have a lot of secrets we know nothing about. <laughs> that's well, that's a, a, the best closing comment ever for this show. <laughs> birds have a lot of secrets. <laughs> All right, bye everyone. Okay, thank you. Bye, bye.